Welcome to The Writing Life, the podcast for anyone who writes. I'm James Gill. And I'm Steph McKenna. From the National Centre for Writing here at Dragon Hall in Norwich. In this episode, National Centre for Writing's Rebecca Devold talks to translator Claire Richards. Rebecca is our Emerging Translator Mentorships Programme Manager, and Claire is a previous mentee who was mentored by Anton Herr. Claire is a translator of Korean, but has a passion for the more challenging scripts, such as Japanese, as she explains in their conversation. As a neurodivergent person, Claire is perfectly placed to reflect on our ableist workplaces and the male-skewed view of autism. And she also describes how learning new languages can help change the way we think and communicate. As you'll hear, Claire really found her calling in literary translation, allowing her to build a way of working that suits her skills and preferences. She's also set up a Discord channel for DDEF, disabled and neurodivergent people, and you can find her on Twitter at Claire Hannah Mary. Claire is just one of our emerging translator mentees. The scheme itself, which we run every year, matches experienced translators with emerging translators for a six-month period. During this time, they work on practical translation projects together and learn about the ins and outs of professionalising as a literary translator. You can find out more about the scheme on our website. And now we bring you Rebecca Devold and Claire Richards. Hi Claire, I'm really pleased to welcome you to the podcast today as we met multiple times on Zoom for People Without Legs because Claire was one of our Emerging Translator Mentorships Programme mentees two years ago now and we also met in person at the London Book Fair which was very exciting and last year, well no last year, this year, this July at um, the National Centre for Writing as where you're a writer in residence. But it's really nice to have the time to actually have a sort of more in-depth chat with you about your work and your motivation as well. I would usually start by asking how you got into translating in general, but I feel like because we were planning on talking about neurodivergence and translation, and in your case, that actually means diving in at the deep end. As you say that your pursuit to become a literary translator was somewhat triggered by your diagnosis. Um, So I was wondering whether you could talk about that a little bit and talk about your background and just elaborate on that, how you, how the two of them are linked for you. Yes, of course. And hi, Rebecca. It's really, it's really great to be here and be able to talk about this topic, which is, well, I guess a passion of mine close to my heart and to have this opportunity to discuss in detail. Yeah, it's a really wonderful thing. So thank you for being on this podcast and inviting me to talk about this. In answer to your question yes exactly it's really for me my journey into literary translation I can't separate it really from my autism diagnosis it's actually the two are very strongly interrelated so to go back I actually I studied my undergraduate degree in psychology and I always had an interest in autism because my younger brother was diagnosed at a very young age. Um, I think it was about four or five years old. So I always, since since I was very small, always had a you know concept of autism, um, what it was, and it was always a big part of my life. But I never, you know, there was no, it never crossed my mind for me or my family members that I might be autistic. So. I did my research, undergraduate research project on autism, um, and I kind of left it there. And it was after I graduated and had tried all sorts of various jobs and every job that most every job that I had, that, you know, that you would consider a ordinary job, whether that was being a teacher or working in an office environment, they just broke me. I was able to do them for a certain length of time I guess I would think my two main jobs that I have one was working as a English language teacher in Japan and after that was working at the Korean Cultural Centre on the film team running film events Korean film events and both on both occasions I was able to force myself to do a good job but I was slowly pushing myself towards the edge and in both on both occasions I ended up collapsing um, the first was severe depression and anxiety, and it took about a year or so to recover that first time. And then when I was working at Korean Cultural Center, I had a relapse. And it was that second time where I kind of had also started to have some exposure to women with autism, whether that was on 
couple of TV documentaries, also read a couple of books. And I started to, you know, explore that and realize that maybe the explanation of why I've struggled so much in these workplace environments is because maybe I'm autistic. And this was, it was a long kind of process of unpacking a lot of, you know, misconceptions I had of autism. And that's because for many, many years, autism has been portrayed as a male condition. And I, that's how I always understood it. And I didn't know, uh, I knew of one or two autistic girls that went to my brother's school, for example. But I, the vast majority that I knew of or was in contact with through my brother's friends, they were all boys, men. And also the research was so, the research itself and the diagnostic criteria so heavily skewed towards men. And it's, I suppose it's in a way, it's a kind of self fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? Because you assume that autism is a male disorder. You're not going to go and look for autism in women. But then it's also partly like who's doing the diagnostics? Is it partly the sort of perpetuated by a male medical profession that is then using? I mean, I think we found that recently with sort of different like vaccine trials and so on as well, that like it's quite hard to find minority groups, although women aren't the minority, but it's kind of like lots of dosages of vaccines are initially tested on men aren't they and then the, you have to adjust the dosage for for the people but anyway that's but this side of my back I can totally see what you mean with the, the portrayal of of autism in sort of medias I mean everybody will think of Dustin Hoffman's Rain Man obviously is the sort of like or the one autistic person you see on film kind of thing. <laughs> like but it's, it's shocking to hear actually that you've um although you've got an, uh, somebody with autism in your family in your close family your brother that 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 nobody thought oh maybe that is something that might be affecting Claire as well that you had to like go and did you have to go and search for a diagnosis yourself in that sense yes so also in response to what you were saying it's so true and it's also something I didn't realize about the medical profession in general and also just the study of physical disease because conditions and diseases as well are so based around men um, as if the center should always be the man and there's not no consideration that this might be different or be experienced differently by women um, it's just an assumption of that's that's the that's the center point that's the beginning point the man which is I, I didn't even I didn't have any realization but um of that at all until I started to hear from some of my friends for example, I suppose unrelated, slightly unrelated, a tangent, but uh, uh, conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome and how understudied they have been because they are, um, um, you know, it's not a, obviously not a male condition, um, it's a female condition. Anything related to the female cycle, I think is probably quite understudied. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, you know, if, if anyone was going to, you know, have an I be able to suspect themselves of, having autism it would be someone who has you know had so much exposure to um autism from a young age and what autism was but actually the diagnostic criteria at the time the diagnostic criteria still are very very um skewed towards how autism presents in boys and men and also how autism expresses itself externally and there's not really any emphasis on the internal experience of autism and I think that's another reason why there why so many women and girls go undiagnosed because I think they internalize their symptoms so I think there's it's a combination both of the problems of the diagnostic criteria and also problems with the gender um, bias in society which expects there's more pressure on women and girls to conform to certain social norms, like you know, being polite and sociable and those kind of things. And there's more pressure on us to be like that. So I think women and girls from a younger age learn to hide their autism and to internalize it. And that means that it goes unrecognized. From my experience growing up, it was much more acceptable for the boys to have their friendships based on shared activities um, rather than just talking and um, you know going for a chat and I've always been much 
more comfortable in uh, socializing, building friends through like, I don't know, playing games together or uh, particularly computer games when I was uh, growing up. And suddenly when I got to secondary school, no one wanted to do that. And I didn't know how to make friends because I didn't know how to talk to people. My friendships had always been based on doing activities together. And I think that's that's why I started to struggle. And also I started, started to learn that I had to mask myself in a way and um, what, you, what they call social masking. I was thinking for the avoidance of doubt, but I think there's there's a lot of doubt in like what you're just explaining in terms of like diagnosis stuff as well. And we were talking about how, you know, there might be a general perception of people who don't know any other autistic people, what they think autism is. And but I was wondering wh whether you could just like say a few things of like how it manifests for you. I mean, you were saying a couple of things in terms of, yeah, how socializing and kind of trying to fit in. But like how, what are the things where you noticed you kind of maybe that you are neurodivergent in that sense where where's the divergence and I know you hate this word <laughs> but um... again still something that I find tricky to put into words exactly but if I was to put it in broad terms I would say it's a different way of seeing and experiencing the world and one of the theories of autism that I find most helpful is the intense world theory of autism which basically we experience the world more intensely and that can be on many different levels so that could be well, I guess one of the notable things is probably the sensory experience of the world and I think this is one of the just one of the reasons I suppose why you know working in a office and an office environment was unsustainable for a lot of autistic basically all autistic people I would say is that sensory aspect so it's noise it's different it's different also for different people as well like for me particularly noise and light it's a very intense experience for me like when I'm in a if I'm in a crowded room and there's lots of different conversations going on I can't filter out the back background noise um, so it's really, really difficult for me to have a conversation with people um, because I, I am hearing everything at the same time. And that becomes, obviously, it makes a very different office environment because there's lots of people talking and lots of people at the same time. And you're not just trying to have a conversation, you're actually trying to do and focus on your work. And then light, if the light, lights are bright, it's like I see everything at once and it's very, very overwhelming. Um, and there can be, you know, there can be really positive aspects of those sensory experiences well you can, when you're able to see so much like when you're seeing something beautiful it's like a more intense experience um but it can be very overwhelming when you're trying to do other things at the same time so if you're again going back to the office example of the office of, of, of a very brightly lit there's a lot of people there um and trying to concentrate on your work when you can you can't you can't tune or even visually tune out what's going on in the background um um also the, i guess there's that intensity when it comes to experiencing emotion i feel like there's this kind of miss there's this very common misconception that autistic people can't and don't empathize but actually when you listen to the experiences of autistic people it's actually very very different if anything we experience things much more intensely and can get overwhelmed and then that can that overwhelm and I think for me it's when it may come across that I'm not em empathizing it's either that I'm overwhelmed by the feelings that I'm experiencing or actually I'm overwhelmed by other things in the world so I don't have the space to to process that so that 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 in, in, intense experience of the world, I think that that just really it, it was it was funny because my friends always described me as intense. And they've been I think they meant they meant they meant in a in a in a good way, but you know it's just it, it applies to my interests. Like if you if I'm interested in something, like I'm kind of all in. I can't do just a little bit, a, a little bit of it. I have to go. So I think that's why I was able to learn two languages in my 20s because just of that like intensity of just like I just want to know everything about this thing if I started I want to know everything about this language 
I couldn't just do like a, a tiny bit so it's a kind of all or nothing thing that applies there that was how I would sum it up in that in that sense I'm personally I think getting a clear picture of how you perceive the world I think which is you know the idea of a conversation and stuff as well but um but I think I could definitely see how like actually this whole idea of like being a stereotype of like what you what you mentioned as well of autistic people not showing emotion not being empathetic is actually what you describe as the complete opposite of that that you're actually like um experience experience it experiencing it's a difficult word um well yeah much more much more intensely and in much more detail um I was wondering whether we could tie that in and you were talking about already about like learning Japanese and Korean in your 20s um because I think we left off when you said you were working in an office we were first teaching in Japan and then you were also working in an office in Korea so when did literary translation kind of come in or translation in general and how has that in a we helped you like yeah sort of adjust your your working setup or kind of like fi find more of a, a place in the world I don't know it sounds a bit grand but um yeah kind of relating it back to to you to the initial question of how did you get into literary translation <laughs> I studied psychology at university but I always had this interest in languages as well um I've always been fascinated by grammar and so when I graduated I thought uh, what I really want to do is take an opportunity to learn another language because I'd never had the chance to do that really even though I'd learned French and Latin in school but actually I've, I just wanted to learn something really different I suppose the, there was there's less perhaps less appeal to me in learning French or Latin because there's much more grammatical similarities so there's less grammar to learn in a way I suppose I decided to learn Japanese because just ling linguistically grammatically it's it the language bears almost no resemblance to English so um, that was just a really exciting idea for me to learn those patterns and also I find myself a very visual person to learn a different script uh, Japanese and I suppose Japanese has three different scripts so to learn three different scripts It's just a really exciting, it's a really exciting prospect to me. I could definitely see the translator mindset in that because I feel like there is something about like learning not just words in a different language, but like learning different rules of a different language that makes you think differently. That kind of, you know, that's, I mean, it's the, the Wolf Sapir, what is, is that their name? The, you know, the thing like you wouldn't be able to think a thought if you hadn't the language, if you didn't have the language for it. But I think there is something in that, like sometimes when you find yourself thinking a thought, you're like, I'm only thinking that because I know this language has a grammatical construction that enables that thought. <laughs> that was a really interesting so. experience because I found that though I spoke some parts of other languages, I considered myself monolingual until I reached a certain point in my Japanese language ability. And then by the time I'd learned Korean as well, I got to the point where I stopped think, really thinking in language, but thinking more in concepts, in abstract concepts. I, th I think that my, uh, having talked to like, other people and other translators, it seems like that's quite like a common experience. I suppose it's an interesting case for me because a lot of people grow up multilingual and because I grew up more monolingual and saw that change shift in my brain, as it were. That was a really That was a really interesting experience because actually that's a kind of ends up being an act of translation itself. Because you've got this, when you want to express something, you've got this kind of abstract idea in your head and then you're selecting a language in which to express the idea. And the language always feels insufficient because the concept or feeling is almost impossible to put into it. There's no perfect words, I suppose. And it's going to end up, depending on which language you select to express that, going to end up being expressed differently. It's really, yeah, I find that, thing really interesting uh, but yeah back to the yeah at that point so I in Japan and I was uh, teaching there but I was just kind of self-studying Japanese in my free time and I just I just I just really loved it and enjoyed it it was just such a I guess when I was there was so much stress and anxiety from my job that you know now I realized was related to my autism but actually that was a time where I could kind of lose myself and then in terms of Korean, I also started learning Korean while I was in Japan. Again, I think just I think just this excitement to learn yeah, another script. It was a, the, the gr grammatically the two languages are very similar, so it wasn't so much learning a new grammar. Although I think Korean and Japanese they, they appear 
similar actually very when you come to see how the different ways in which you're expressing yourself in the two languages you see how different they are then I just decided I came back to the UK I did a master's in Korean studies um, because there's funding available and I really wanted to go back to studying I think that stress of working in the real world as it were and being able to go back to my solace which is learning um, and academics was very appealing and I did that and then there was another opportunity to spend a year in Korea studying Korean with the Korean Korean Foundation sorry Korea Foundation and that was when I came back to UK again and so I wasn't actually working in office in Korea though it's it's very similar things I was working for the Korean Cultural Center which is I got the government in institution part of basically part of the Korean embassy so it was very very similar to working in in Korea because it's a Korean bureaucratic institution and uh, <laughs> it's almost like you could it's part of the em- part of the embassy right so I mean I learned I learned so much from that experience and there was some particularly working with Korean film and there's so many interesting aspects about it me and my boss would always talk about how we need to write a sitcom about uh working there but obviously there was no time to do that but it would have been there was just so many funny interesting because it's 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 always like it's like it's a microcosm isn't it it's like it's like you've 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 kind of plucked a piece of Korea and you've put it into the UK and it's just such interesting characters and it's some really really nice people but obviously so again there's also huge amounts of frustration with the that comes along with the uh, uh, bureaucracy as well. But um, though there was, I, I learned a lot from that experience. Again, it I just wasn't, I just wasn't able to cope. My boss was very, at the time I hadn't got my diagnosis. This was what triggered me to go, seek out my diagnosis because I'd relapsed into depression and I'd done everything I could to try and make myself feel better. Like I was sleeping well, I was eating well, you know, I was seeing my friends. It was then I was like, well, actually, I it kind of makes sense that I've had a relapse into depression if I'm autistic, because actually I'm not able to, all this is too much for me. All of these difficulties, the setup of normal in inverted commas office environment is so, actually so ableist now that I understand it. And it was only natural that my body and mind would react in that way. And that's when I decided I needed to seek out a diagnosis because at that point I was so, I didn't know anyone else in a, like anyone similar to me. I didn't know any other autistic women um, around me. So I was, had so much self doubt, even though everything about it, the every, more I read, the more it made sense to me that I was autistic. I still had so much self doubt because of all, those years of those misconceptions that built up so I really felt that that I needed to get an official diagnosis otherwise I would never feel settled I think now I'm at the point where actually I know I know actually a lot of you know several other autistic translators who are really who I can relate so strongly to and if it was if I was at that point now I wouldn't probably wouldn't feel the need to you know seek out a, a formal diagnosis because I'd feel much more comfortable being like actually this makes sense I'm autistic and to self-identify but at the time, I didn't know anyone. I felt completely isolated. Like, I've got to have a formal diagnosis. Otherwise, I'm never going to settle this. So I actually chose to go privately because I was really concerned. Another thing that I was really concerned about is being assessed by a clinician who didn't understand autism in women and so would not diagnose me. So I actually, there's a one well-known you know, autism re- researcher called Lorna Wing I believe she's passed now but there's a there's a lot so in Bromley there's a place called the Lorna Wing Centre and they were recommended to me as understanding autism and women well so I went there and paid for the assessment and I got my diagnosis and that was where that was where it, uh, it started and it was at this point uh, just before then as well that I decided I needed to quit my job because I couldn't cope and one of my colleagues at the Korean Cultural Centre had told me about the Literature Translation Institute of Korea. I mean, I'd never read a novel in Korean before. Um, I'd read translations, uh, but I'd never read a novel in Korean. Um, and I was like, um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do this. But while I was working at Korean Cultural Center, this is what first got me thinking about translation. Um, I was 
we needed a lot of things translated, like film subtitles, uh, articles, whatever. And it was often very difficult to get hold of a, either hold of a translator uh, who could do it or, you know, uh, there were agencies, but the with agencies, the we just had some the, the in, inconsistent quality. And so at some point, I just, just ended up starting to do the translations myself. So I just found that, and I just found that I really enjoyed it. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. Maybe this is something I could actually be good at. When I heard about uh, making the jump to translating literature seemed uh, <laughs> extreme, given I never read a novel in Korean, but that we had a library at the Korean Cultural Center. So I started to take the books out in Korean and start to read them. And it was a challenge at first because I, I think naturally when you're reading a novel, you're, read, you're coming across words that you don't hear so much in everyday conversation. Uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of words I wasn't familiar with and I was very slow. But I just thought, well, let's give it a go. I'll let the Literature Translation Institute of Korea provide these offer offer these two year uh, translation training programs that are kind of on, on a scholarship. So I thought I'll just try applying for it because when I was thinking about my autism diagnosis and realizing, okay, well, I I can't cope with this ordinary working environment. And I was at the point where I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to have a job. Like, I just can't cope. I was literally point where I was like, I just, I, maybe I'm just going to have to be unemployed my whole life because I just cannot. I'm just, these, these situations are just breaking me completely. It's not just, it's not a case of mind over matter. Like my whole body is like shutting down. And this was, uh, I actually had gone on a, holiday with friends and at the end of the holiday I got really sick and I came back and it, it turns out I had meningitis and no one ever found out the reason for that but I mean part of me thinks that my immune system was must have been really really in a bad way because of just being unable to cope and I see it very all very linked together and it was that you know if, if, at that point I was like, I just can't carry on and then this idea of maybe I could pursue translation uh, came into the picture and I was like this could be this could be the perfect job for me because actually working as a literary translator means that I can work within my own space and according to my own schedule um, I can adjust and that's uh, until the ordin ordinary workplace um, adjusts itself and yeah, gets rid of its ableism and realizes that some people work differently I realized I couldn't go back into it and actually if I became a translator I can have that space where I can just fully, deeply focus into one task and I can have my environment set up with just being at home, no one around, I can have my lighting low, you know, I don't have to have any sounds or any distractions. And I think that's very interesting as well when relation to obviously when the pandemic happened and people started to be allowed to work from home uh, more often. Yeah, I had a lot of people saying like, oh, you know, post pandemic, when they started to have to go back and commute again, that everything just seemed so much louder and so much stressful, more stressful. And everything feel, felt so overwhelming. And I said to them, well, that's, that's what it's like for an autistic person all the time. Um, so it was really interesting to hear that from people. And uh, also, I thought that, that was kind of like an opportunity to uh, kind of share and help people to understand what the autistic experience is like but it also shows like it's it's these kind of classic things of like a lot of these adjustments to the workplace that you talk about is like that would just a lot of them would just make life nicer for everybody like it's not just like oh we have to make these massive adjustments for like one person in the group and then people being up in arms about like having to lower dim the lighting not having those like um strip lights and like um and just like have open plan offices, but have like booths, like all of these things, or like, yeah, what you're saying, like not commuting to work every day, but maybe a couple of days a week. And it's like, everybody seems to be enjoying that. So it's just kind of like, we would all be much happier if we did that. So why are you so resistant to it? Like, it just, yeah, it's just baffling. Cause like, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's shocking. Like, I'm, I'm obviously I'm, I'm really glad that like the dark art of translation has gained you. Um, but, um, but it's shocking that you had to like, obviously, go through this and it sounds like it's almost like you know a sort of like health crisis that then triggered saying like I have to change something which is like you you hear in, in people's stories regularly I feel like that's like you know people being unhappy with their lives or things aren't working and but just kind of being at the point where it's like it's 
it's not you I mean you were like completely fully skilled in what you were doing and you were doing your job well and minor adjustments could have like you know didn't need to get to the point of you saying I absolutely can't do this work anymore and get because I think you said you were 29 when you got diagnosed like that's just like I mean you're an adult by this point like to kind of then because then it becomes a sort of like I have to change my life rather than growing up with it already knowing what kind of what you what is good for you and beneficial for you and what isn't beneficial for you you, you would have maybe you know you hopefully would have come to be a translator anyway but like you know without the trials and tribulations and like just stress and and, and just like shocking and like these times of uncertainty that you have to go through just because people don't see this diagnosis as um yeah because you're not you know a sort of like typical case like that fits into their medical box of like how because you're not a boy with autism effectively and like yeah and just like work workplace is not being set up in that way i mean as a as a translator myself who's not um not diagnosed as neurodivergent i like but i fully understand the thing we talk about like i enjoy working at home I do also like, I often t- describe translators as a sort of like selected extrovert. <laughs> I think yeah. because this whole like you as an introvert or an extrovert thing isn't doesn't really cut it because I think in my experience, a lot of translators I meet as well enjoy being amongst other people and enjoy talking to translators as well and being like outgoing, but need a sort of space to come back to that's like their own space and their own workplace and their own setup. So like I can really see how, yeah how you, you choose that as a sort of work setup as well um to me that is the sort of preferred preferred way of working as well of kind of like having having a mix of these um you've got a couple of ways that you said you adjusted kind of like how you how you work now do you want to share about what you what you work um like how you work and what you translate and how you how your sort of normal working day or week or month looks like so the general I guess day-to-day schedule that I do would I find I think this is probably common for a lot of translators but there's only a certain amount of translation I can do in one day um it just it I guess there's something about translation that just uses so much uh, so much of your brain um the way I like to plan my days and obviously sometimes it can't always go to the schedule but this is like my ideal where sending a schedule is um I spend a few hours in the morning focusing on just doing my translation so that's usually I'm not the fastest translator so I would do like five or six pages of a novel each day in the morning whatever novel I'm working on um at the time uh, I would spend my mornings doing that I've actually started using a speech to text application. This was because I, again, this is probably a different problem for many translators is how do we avoid repetitive strain injury? Um, so I, I felt that that was coming. I was like, before I, I can't, if I lose my, if I lose my hands, I'm not going to be able to work. So <laughs> I was like, I need to change, I need to change my day. You know, I never had this problem before, but I suppose when working in an office, you're so, actually what you're doing is quite varied. You, you're not going to be spending all of your time for three hours typing um you'll be sending an email then maybe having a meeting or like you know reading something kind of thing as a you're kind of right you're typing all the time uh, so it's only natural that uh, translators <laughs> often uh, get that so that's i started using those speech to uh text i took a while to get used to um but that's actually been very 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 helpful for um my hands and then in the afternoons I tend to, again, in my ideal schedule, I spend editing. So usually what I do is go uh, self-edit the translation I did the day before. And I will just, it's, yeah, self-edit. So basically like tidying stuff up and also going back over the source text as well that I translated just to check I haven't missed anything. You know, it's, it's always like, well, I haven't, you know, mis- misread a certain section. Just so I kind of keep up that kind of, uh, so I think if you, I find that if you, if I translate like a whole book and then go back and start editing from the beginning, uh, it can feel like a long slog. So I, to do it in stages, I find uh, works much better for me. Um, I also spend the rest of my 
afternoon um be catching up on emails also if I'm doing some other editing work um I'll work on that but I kind of divide it like that I see I see my mornings as when my when I have my most brain power to focus on the translation itself and then in the afternoons to do something different which is I find like the editing uses a different part of my brain um yeah so that's how my day-to-day would be I work from home um I guess the advantage of again working from home I can work from wherever I am but it would be generally working actually at home rather than going out to a cafe or whatever is best for me because it's quiet I can I don't have to sit in you know bright light um that's kind of most comfortable for me so that's that's usually how I work on a day-to-day basis. And which part of the translation process do you prefer? Do you prefer the first drafting? Do you prefer the editing? Do you prefer the proofreading right at the end to tidying up? Have you got a favourite bit? My least favourite is definitely the proofreading. So I find that's, for me anyway, I find it quite boring. Um, <laughs> uh, probably it's probably the same for, actually to be fair, I'm sure that there's a lot of people that enjoy it. But um, for me, it's like, well, I've already done the interesting part and now I'm just like, Kind of scanning for something, you know, for some slight areas, or just reading the same thing over that I've already read a hundred times. I think I would say I, I enjoy the translation and the editing process equally, as long as I'm translating something that I like and is well written. I really notice the difference when, at the moment, um, I am working on translating a short story collection um, by a writer called. Im Sora and it's just I've just started working on the first story from the book and it's just such a pleasure to translate something that's so clear and so well written there's no element of doubt when you've written when you're reading something translating something that it's just so technically well written it's just such a pleasure because you're reading this just excellently written sentence you're thinking how can I express this well in English. So first of all, the translation process is really interesting and satisfying because you've got this beautiful sentence and you're thinking about how can I express it in English? And then when you get to the editing process, you're just kind of like refining that and, you know, creating a sentence you feel does justice to that sentence to begin with. The way I kind of see it is, and this is the authors that I choose to translate, I really like very clear card writing, I suppose. I kind of compare it to like a game of Tetris so when like all the pieces like the kind of writing I like is when like all the pieces are perfectly aligned um so you've got all the like Tetris pieces and there's a yeah, perfect the perfect like five lines or whatever I want four lines if you want you do once it's just perfect sentence and it's just so satisfying whereas there are a lot of time where I'm being commissioned to translate say a short article or something like that and you know that the person that's written this article has rushed it. Um, and this is a lot of cases when translating these short pieces, you know, because you've been asked, oh, we've got this article coming up, can you, can translate, can you translate it? I'm like, okay. And the delivery of, and by the time that they say, well, I'm going to deliver it by this date, and it comes much later, and you immediately know, okay, the writer of the article has missed the deadline and forgotten about this article and just thrown something together last minute. And when you come to translate it, it's just like, it's, it's like you're dealing with the Tetris. It's like almost right to the top of the screen and there's all these like holes in the sentences. And you're first of all, you have to spend so much time actually, when you just read, if you just read the article in the source and just thought about, well, you just skimmed it over, you kind of get the idea. But when you go to translate it, you realize actually, wait, hang on a second. This isn't clear or that isn't clear. You're working with a, a source material that has a lot of holes in it. And so when it comes to translation process, you're actually trying to compensate for that. And I find that far, far less satisfying and far more time consuming, actually. It's interesting because I, I also often find myself then not really caring about the text that much because you feel like the author who wrote it didn't really care that much. Why should I then be putting in the care that they lacked? Like you, and you, then you kind of resent having to translate it when it's really, when it's really bad because you just like... Nobody really wants to, nobody wanted to write this. Nobody wanted to translate it. Does anybody want to read it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, resent, oh yeah, resenting is the way. I just resent the fact that I'm translating, yeah. um, which is not, not a position that uh, you want to be in, is it? No, I think that's, that's you know, the, the, the ideal would be that I can keep working on 
novels and I get to the point where I don't have to accept these uh <laughs> these other commissions that so it's a very very ideal world but yeah I, I can I completely agree with you and then you're also like if I was going to mimic the source I would have to make my translation terrible <laughs> which I I can't bring myself to do um because something that's going to reflect badly on you isn't it um as a translator that just adds it's like almost like you're you're not only translating but you're also acting as editor of the source to begin with and that's just a, something you're not being paid for so I think that's also part of the yeah. resentment but it's also yeah because you know you will take the blame because people always readers always blame the translator if the text doesn't make it they never they assume they're your author is great um I was wondering so we talked about like obviously how you what you gained from like joining the translation community but also equally I was wondering whether what do you think the translation community can learn about the sort of nature of communication and language learning and and translation itself from the experience of some for neurodivergent translators are there any particular things that you can pinpoint to that mm. well actually as part of the Translators Association Committee were running um, two events, as you know, for the TA at Home and Society of Authors at Home series. And one of the panels is going to be basically about this exact topic. It's just going to be it's next next Wednesday, uh, which will by the time this obviously this podcast is 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 ahead will be in the uh, in the past. But the I, I understand that the the event will be available afterwards on the Society of Authors Vimeo channel. So if anyone is interested in hearing more about this topic, not just from you know me, but from I'll be speaking in that panel, but the with three other three other translators. So it'll be chaired by Tanya Gold and I'll I'll be one of the panelists. Also with Paige and Naya Morris and Poeen Richards. We aren't related. <laughs> we have the same surname. Talking about this, you know, these topics will be one of the questions that we will talk about is um, what can the neurodivergent uh, experience tell us about the nature of uh, language learning and about um, trans translations so you know if you're interested in hearing hearing more about this uh, please do listen back to that event um, I'm sure the others may have something more, more, more articulate than what they're, or not this, what they're saying than I am. I was going to say just on a TA note as well, whether you want to, but you might have wanted to talk about that anyway, so I'm sorry if I just <laughs> interrupted you about the, um, because you also joined the Translators Association as a committee member last year, um, and you, were, um, you also dived in at the deep end straight away with like heading up the inclusion and accessibility working group as well to kind of um make make a heard of um how how new how many neurodivergent and disabled translators there are and kind of what the working conditions are and stuff so do you want to talk a bit about your your work with that as well and your other general activism kind of you know turning your your experience into like a force for good as it were yeah i mean if I was to say one thing that I'd like people to take away from the disabled and neurodivergent experience of translation, I'd say for me, like translation is the only thing I could ever imagine myself doing at this point. You know, translation for me almost wasn't a choice. Like this is this is the only career that I feel that I'm able to do given the ableist nature of the ordinary working place. It brings me as a craft it brings me so much joy and satisfaction I think if if tra literary translation or translation was a more accessible field that would be I just think there must be so many other autistic people out there and this is not just an issue of translation but this is also an issue of language learning and language teaching in schools so many schools I think do not teach well, in my brother's case for example he never learned a foreign language in school because Well, he was diagnosed at a young age and he went to an autistic unit for a secondary school. And none of the none of the students there were taught foreign languages because this idea is that, well, autistic autistic people have communication problems and therefore they cannot learn foreign languages, which is it's obviously it's a misconception. So there's like this this potential, you know, area of so many autistic people I believe would really excel in is being cut off from them at a young age. 
Um, and I think for myself as well, if I had been diagnosed at a younger age, maybe I never would have learned languages because I would have kind of had that kind of misconception put into my mind since being very young. And, you know, actually this, the nature of literary translation is both so accessible to me because of the how I can work on a day-to-day basis, but it's also so inaccessible. Literary translation is such an inaccessible field for everyone, um, but even more so, I think, for autistic people. And just, you know, it's a field that relies, it's so opaque. And as an autistic person, I love things to be very clear. Um, I think this is, again, something all people would benefit from is there was just less opacity in the field. And I think that for me, the most important thing was the National Centre for Writing Emerging Translators Mentorship. That was, I, I think that completely, that was, Though, yes, the term sounds cliched, it was life-changing and career-changing for me and um, my mentor, Anton Her, really, like, I'm still, I just will be eternally grateful for all the support that he gave me and continues to give me. But it was just having that structured support for me that was just, that was, that was really the key. Someone who could guide me through this very opaque process. And I think those kind of things, uh, and actually Rebecca and I, as part of the work on the access working group for the TA committee, I talked about and suggested maybe we could have a specific mentorship for a disabled or neurodivergent translator. And that's something we had a meeting about and the kind of idea that's in the pipeline to add that. Yeah, it would definitely be great. So if any sponsors are listening out there, um, yes. <laughs> any, or if anybody's got any funding suggestions um but yeah I think it's definitely something that's really important because the the point of the program of the emerging translator mentorships program is to feature underrepresented languages and underrepresented translators who are like not currently being translated into English or currently not translating into English and that's for a variety of reasons we've got the visible communities program which is for um Black, Black, Asian, ethnically diverse translators, or somebody working from a heritage diaspora or community language based in the UK. But we haven't currently got anything that's specifically for translators who are neurodivergent or um, identify as disabled. So, and that is, yeah, it's definitely because of all the things you're saying, like the two translation being being opaque and how you get into it, but also it being when you're doing the the translation itself it is the sort of you can you can adjust your work environment but so much of like actually getting to the point of getting the jobs is like it's the hustle of the freelancer and that's that is super stressful even for somebody who's not um disabled who's not no average and that's like for like just having to be out and about and like you know worrying about when the next job comes through and and those kind of things um yeah I really hope that like we can as a this is with my translator position hat on as well like hopefully we can change something about that as well make that yeah more accessible more transparent as well and just kind of improve working conditions and and getting to work conditions if that makes sense on a sort of working note and to like sadly wrap up this very um very engaging and very enlightening chat. Um, I was wondering what you're working on at the moment and what's next for you. Are you learning any other new scripts and languages? Are you working on a an exciting translation project at the moment? Have you got any other exciting writing projects coming up? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, Are you allowed to talk about them? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Well, the what I'm currently working on as I mentioned, was this uh, writer called Insora, her short story collection. Um, also, I've been working on her first, well, her first and only uh, novel, actually with an agent. Uh, so I'm really excited about that book. So I'm really hoping the agent finds a good home for it because it's a really interesting, wonderful book. And various, various other projects in the pipeline. My fir- Well, my first novel translation is coming out next next year with Pushkin Press in June, which is really, really exciting. Just got the proofs for that yesterday. So yeah, look look out for that one. That was the book that I worked on with Anton during the mentorship. So it's really exciting. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad because we... Um... Because as part of the mentorship, we, we published a sampler. And so we got a teaser of that book. But you don't know because you can't read the book because it's not been translated yet. But now it has. Yay. Yes. <laughs> That's very cool. Yes, I, also, um, I will also be editing a novel for Tilted Access Press called Didi's Umbrella by writer Huang Jong-un. 
translated by Emily Ye Won. So that's re- that's 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 very exciting for me because that's the writer I really put with the writer and translator who whose work I very much respect. So there's there, there there's other always other potential projects in the pi- pipeline. One is translation of a cookbook, um, which is which is a, well, I love cooking, so that's a really exciting exciting one for me. And I do I have also yes been working on a uh, I guess a non-fiction book proposal for many of the similar, many questions similar to what we've been talking about today, about a neurodivergence and translation, kind of breaking down misconceptions and what, what the neurodivergent experience could tell us about the, um, the, the nature of translation, language learning, communication, um, all things that I'm very interested in on the, on the back burner, but I have been working on that. One, yeah, one thing I wanted, I did want to mention is that I recently set up a Discord channel for deaf, disabled, and neurodivergent uh, translators. There's about like 20 of us on there. I always wanted to meet other uh, disabled neurodivergent translators. I wondered if they were out there, and turns out they are. They were, and it's that's just been really to be able to talk to and kind of build uh, friendships, I guess, with other people with similar experiences has been really amazing and so if if there's any one out there who would like to join please just get in touch with me on uh like twitter is uh hopefully i'll be attached to the bio of this podcast but it's claire hannah mary it's my twitter handle uh, c-l-a-r-e uh please get in touch oh no yeah i'll share the link to the uh to join the channel Thanks so much, Claire. This has been such a pleasure to talk to you and to hear all about your projects at the end that make, left me very invigorated as well. Like, there's, there's hope for an improvement as well. <laughs> Things are looking up, definitely. And I'm obviously definitely super excited about um, your book coming up with Push Confess next um, June. So I'll, I'll mark that in my diary as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire. Thank you. A big thank you to both Rebecca and Claire for their time. If you have questions or want to get in touch, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Writers' Centre. And you'll find us on Facebook by searching National Centre for Writing. Don't forget to sign up to our weekly newsletter by visiting nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk and clicking the orange drop-down box on the homepage. As a UK-registered charity, we rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation over on the website today by hitting the Support Us button in the top nav. Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review us because it helps other writers to find the podcast. Thanks again. Keep writing and we'll catch you on the next episode.